Okay, th thanks everyone for joining us in front of this amazing towering installation behind us um, with one of the rock stars of this APT, um, uh, Anita Uali, um, also known as the Bug Lady um, from her infamous performances. Um, I'd like to once again, uh, as we're all gathered here, acknowledge the traditional o uh, owners of the land which we're gathered upon um, and pay my respects to their elders past and present and their ongoing ties to, to the land which we're gathered here. Um, so, Anita, big weekend. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. Thank you very much. And Chamrip Sua, everybody. Thank you for coming. Um, before we, we talk about the bug and your performances this weekend um, and this amazing work behind us that I can't wait to hear you speak about, I did want to ask a little bit about, um, about your experience and kind of the development of your art practice. Um, you, you left Cambodia when you were quite young, um, during the Khmer Rouge period? I, um, after the Khmer Rouge period. So I, I and my family went through the, the, the war period. So and I, I left when I was five. And then, um, uh, so your practice really developed uh, in the US, I guess, your art practice, and a significant art practice that you, uh, that you built. But I wanted to ask how that, that history and that background and the knowledge of what had happened in your country of birth, um, how that crept in and out of your artwork or whether it was always very, very present and upfront? Mm -hmm. Well, I feel like my practice has been going between the two countries um, and between the two regions, between uh, North America and Asia Pacific and between specifically the US and Cambodia. I don't think one can say that my practice um, you know, was formulated in the US and then brought back to Cambodia. Um, I feel like uh, my education was, um, the institutional education was formulated in the US, uh, but so much of the initiation and the realization of my work didn't take off until coming to Cambodia in 2011 and being with the land and actually moving there and living there and working there. Um, I always tell people that I feel like the things that I created in America were sketches leaving up to um, how I was able to realize and actualize work that meant something um, much more deeper for me uh, in Cambodia and that really began in 2011. Although, as someone who is a diasporic um, artist, all of it began, of course, before 2011 with the, the war and the displacement, the refugee identity, the, um, the Muslim, the Islam that my parents carried with them back to the US um, that they preserved for me, and then my rediscovery of Cambodia and Buddhism through my journeys. Um, yeah, and I just, I, I wanted to uh, maybe dig a little bit deeper on that return to Cambodia. In 2011, you returned to Cambodia. Um, and so, I mean, you obviously found a motif um, that, uh, you know, is a really creative way to engage with your experience of, of leaving and returning um, and the community you belong to. Um, uh, more broadly in Cambodia um, and uh, I, I, was, I was wondering, I know you, you, know, you create a lot of art w other works alongside uh, the Buddhist bug but I was wondering where that, that idea kind of, um, when did that I idea come to you? Was it before you returned to Cambodia or, or was yeah. it something that really evolved uh, when, you, when you made that return? So I, you know, um, I actually returned to Cambodia for the first time at the age of 30 in 2004. But I didn't really make work and I would return um, several times between 2004 and 2007. Um, then I would take a break and go into graduate school from 2007 to 2010. But all that time between 2004 and 2011 with the multiple trips to Cambodia, 
I never made any work. I kept writing in my journal, I kept observing, I kept witnessing and just allowing myself to experience very raw emotions and just um, unraveling the history of Cambodia, my relationship to it, my relationship to people, what my parents must have felt like when they were there, what, what their worlds looked like. But upon that return um, and several trips to Southeast Asia, one thing that was really um, apparent to me and also very beautiful were the um, the amount of saffron robes. It was almost as if the landscape was orange, that you couldn't go to any parts of Southeast Asia without seeing this color orange in your periphery and in your um, you know, vision. And of course, that orange is reflective of the Buddhism that is everywhere in Southeast Asia. Of course, unless you go to Malaysia or Indonesia. Um, so for me, uh, being and seeing that, it just it made such a deep impression in my mind that I filed it all that time. And then I started to understand how very small Islam was in proportion to the Buddhism of Cambodia. And that was when, for me, it really solidified sort of how perilous my parents' journey was in leaving Cambodia, in being a target of um, uh, the, the Khmer Rouge's hate, and then also in how, how much they wanted to preserve their Islamic identity in America as Cambodians, so multiple layers of that. And so all of this complexity is what has created this creature that seems to bring a lot of smiles to people, which is a, a very hybrid creature that blends both Islam and Buddhism into a way to invite people in this conversation that is about religious intolerance. It just wasn't my intention that would be so significant now with the global crisis and um, you know all, all of the negativity around Islam. So it, it's just something that I've been interested in because I have a personal um, spiritual turmoil in the process of developing as a young adult and into adulthood and now as someone raising um, you know, uh, children who, who uh, we, we don't raise them in one religion or the other, but kind of all religions. Yeah, I think, I mean, it's such a fascinating um, and interesting and unique way to draw that out um, while being a little bit playful sometimes and a little bit ha haunting at other times. Um, but uh, something else I just wanted to, to draw upon, which I think I've, I've heard you um, touch upon this before, but uh, a number of other Cambodian artists, and that's, um, that's that, uh, I mean, through, with what uh, Cambodia has experienced in the past, and a, a great loss of artists, you know, almost a, a, a generation as I understand it, um, but also a great loss of uh, archival materials and uh, artists coming up, um, that, that documentation, I, I guess, is probably quite, quite thin. Um, and I think I've heard you comment saying this is, is your way to, to document Cambodia as well and, and add to that, um, that absence a little bit. Yeah, um, I think, you know, especially with performance work, um, there's the experience of performance in the moment and then there's the sort of... Um, um, ex how you extend that view beyond that moment into um, other opportunities to show and exhibit the work. Um, and so for me, it's been about capturing those moments um, onto photos and videos in which the, it, it's combined with the rapid change that's happening in Cambodia. I mean, when I went in 2011, it was a very different experience than 2004, 2006, 2007. And so when I returned to move there in 2011, I felt this very palpable energy um, amongst my colleagues, amongst um, the artist community, in which there felt like a kind of critical mass um, in which the artist community was finally addressing the present moment and not just locked in time in referencing the past and the past trauma. 
And so to me, that was a really exciting part. And I knew we had something special that intersected with um, the rate of progress, and I'm going to put that in quotes, and modernization and urbanization that's happening at um, a tremendous rate in Cambodia, um, while the level of poverty you know, increased. So for me, it's um, oftentimes, as a diasporic person, you have this sort of nostalgia on Cambodia. And so through the documentation, I feel like I'm um, reclaiming memories of, of the Cambodia that I'm experiencing and witnessing, the five years that were taken away from me as a child through the trauma that I'm now able to um, extend into my performance work and reclaim those five years through the exhibition of, of these photographs that, that document a landscape, both rural and urban, um, of, of my Cambodia. I think that was really palpable when um, uh, I visited Cambodia. I mean, obviously, I was there with uh, Chris Sainz, um, and we were there for a very, very short time. But I think, uh, I think just as you mentioned, that was you could really feel that, that, that a lot of artists are making work about the contemporary moment but none of that history is ever forgotten. And everyone, I felt that everyone in their own way had to deal with that. But I also felt it, it seemed like a really exciting time for Cambodian contemporary art. There was just such a buzz and such an energy. Um, in your few years of living there, do you want to comment on maybe where you think it might be going and what's kind of happening in general terms at the moment, if that's possible? Yeah, I mean, um when I got there, I mean, it was supposed to only be a 10-month fellowship. I arrived on a U.S. Fulbright and, um, you know, had left everything behind and, and went there, but with this idea that I was only engaged in a 10-month um, artistic-based research and then I would return. But because we were so inspired by what was happening both in the film industry, I mean, the re-emergence of film and the contemporary art scene that we stayed on, that we said, uh, we being my, my uh, filmmaker partner who also runs um, Studio Revolt, which is, this is what, this is a result of our collaborative media lab. We um, said to each other, like, we need to be here and we need to um, trust our impulse and be part of uh, what's unfolding uh, in a contemporary context. And it's very important for us because we're not there to teach people and to school people, which seems to be a model of the NGOs, um, which is also, in my opinion, um, a bit problematic because it creates a culture of dependency there. And so instead, what we wanted to do and what I wanted to do was just make art because I think that would be the best way to be amongst your colleagues, is to keep making art and to kind of flex different muscles and different ideas so that there's um, a kind of conversation that's happening amongst artists because artists there are not getting the kind of formal education that we're used to in Western societies and maybe in Australian culture. But the, what, what, how they learn is through experiencing and through workshops and through seeing and observing. And so I feel like we were very much immersed in that um, as my husband was a filmmaker and I helped to produce the films, but also in the level of imagination and the um, ambitiousness of our work, you know, being able to, to be in that context and you know, we were told many times we couldn't do things and people would in many ways um, censor their own level of potential and imagination. But for, for me, I just kept pushing the line. I was like, what do you mean we can't cut open the roof of the tuk-tuk and stick her head out? You know, and I would just push that line every single time and say, no, I think we can do that. I think we can ask the tuk-tuk driver if he would be down for this. In return, he would get a convertible tuk-tuk top that now has a zipper that he can, you know, uh, have people stick their heads out if he wanted. This is something different. So it's kind of you work with that. You know, you work with... Um, and you, you, t you, we were forced to talk. In my very broken Khmer, which got better through the time, I was forced to engage in a way that pushed the line, and hopefully, help people to help my other colleagues to understand that it is possible to create 
very ambitious work with limited resources. Um, I mean, you just started touching on it, but I, I really wanted you to um, maybe talk about making this work itself. Um, when I got an email from Anita saying it was crazy, coming from her, I was like, this must have been pretty wild. <laughs> Do you want to tell us a little bit about the actual shoot? I mean, you can see, you can see the level of production uh, behind me, and um, I mean, it shows in Anita's uh, uh, um, work with film and, and video, but do you want to talk a little bit about the yeah, shoot? Yeah, so we, uh, my partner and I, Masahiro, um, we had this idea that we felt like there was one last thing that needed to complete our journey with the Buddhist bug. We began with a lot of daytime shots in um, Phnom Penh, and with that first generation of work, I felt if that wasn't enough, that I needed the rural aspect and I needed to reflect on my, my um, birth village being in Battambang, which is um, a rural-based city. And so I did that second generation of work, which is um, done in a rural setting. And so you see um, a lot of palm trees and rice fields and ox carts um, and sunrises. Um, and then I felt like that wasn't enough. There was some, some sort of grittiness that was really missing um, that would really kind of put a punctuation point on um, the whole journey with the Buddhist bug and the whole collection of work. And so that was when you guys came through and then you were interested in new work and I just was talking to Masahiro and saying, wouldn't it be great if she went to a discotheque and started to dance, except she doesn't dance because she just vacillates? Um, so that was the impetus for the work was, wow, we should really explore her nightlife and take her into kind of this, you know, underbelly of Phnom Penh. And so that's what you see here executed is she's above ground. It, she begins at the amusement park in this very lit, innocent setting and then she kind of goes more to the underground aspect of the nightlife of Phnom Penh being the karaoke bars, the, um, the sexy bar girl scene, the, um, uh, the disco, I mean it actually goes from the disco um, and then to uh, the, the sexy girl bar where uh, there are transactional girlfriends and you know that's a whole issue in Southeast Asia and then she goes to the KTV and she tries to enjoy this karaoke mo moment but then there's sort of a lot of shadiness around um, women's bodies and the way that women's bodies are used at nighttime and so it was really important for me to just juxtapose this creature's body that comes in the name of peace and humor and laughter and of course bigger issues like otherness and foreignness next to these and she's very clothed you know the bug is completely in full hijab she's completely covered next to these scantily dressed girls who you know some were very empowered to do what they're doing and others not so others were definitely objectified um, under the gaze um, and so I wanted that juxtaposition and curiosity um, in, in the whole piece. Um, and so that's the journey, that's sort of the arc that you take uh, in the narrative. Um, but also it's to capture this, this, this nightlife where you have the tuk-tuks and the, the motorcycles and the cars because at some point you're not going to see all these motorcycles. We've seen this in all societies, you know, from transitioning from the bicycle. I mean, you just look at China and you see the transition from the 1980s with, you know, thousands of bicycles to now where everybody is about that middle class dream of having the cars. And so we knew that that traffic shot was very important to um, creating this moment in Phnom Penh, which we know will disappear um, in the next few years. And I guess that relates to the, the previous question I asked you as well. And I think it feels like you really get a um, quite an honest depiction of, um, of nightlife in Phnom Penh. So, and congratulations on the hugely ambitious work. And I know you did all the um, post-production 
moving uh, countries with three <laughs> young children and a curator in Australia hassling you for marketing <laughs> images, so thank you for that. Um, uh, I also wanted to just, uh, I'm on the topic of performance, um, and I wanted to thank everyone involved in the performance yesterday and today. Um, Miguel, who starred as The Feet, no one, will know, no one would have known whose feet it was, so thank you, Miguel. <laughs> um, uh, thank you to, to Dana Langlois from uh, Java Arts um, and the public programs team. I think you can see this enormous bug. It's a, it's a huge kind of uh, staging um, uh, process. Uh, but, uh, and, and the bug has appeared now in these live performances in, uh, in a number of places around the world now. Um, and do you want to tell us a little bit about um, some of the reactions you get? Um, yesterday's uh, performance at the Water Mall, um, how many of you experienced that? Just so that this is like, there's a little back and forth, okay. How many of you um, experienced the performance earlier in the morning at the Bodhi Tree? Okay, have any of you experienced the performance in other cities of the Buddhist bug? Perhaps Japan or somewhere? Yeah, I see you, curator. <laughs> um, that's great. So um, yesterday's performance, I felt, was a lot more, uh, there was a sense of cerebralness, and um, there was um, a distance that was very interesting that also created a kind of isolation as people approached the bug. And I just had some very profound moments with people in this, in, um, in just looking at people. And I think it creates a moment of engagement that people can't escape. This idea of looking at each other, at each other eye to eye, which we've lost you know, through so many things because the world is so mediated, whether it's through television or through these smart gadgets and, and et cetera. And so I think that the power of performance, especially live performance, is a way to reactivate those moments that we need with each other to see the humanity. And so I think that's also something very interesting is to see the humanity of the bug. I mean, we all know that, you know, she's, a, she's an imaginative creature and there's a suspension of belief in that moment of interaction, but in the moment where she is looking at people and you have this moment where the walls all drop down and I'm just looking at somebody who's a complete stranger and you crack a smile or I keep the stoicness, I don't know, I kind of just um, go in the moment, but there's a warmthness, there's a warmth that comes out and there's a moment of peace that happens between two people, which I think is a really powerful idea. And so that happened several times yesterday. I felt more so than this morning. Um, this morning it was outside near the Bodhi tree, which is also very symbolic in terms of Buddhism. But um, this morning it was about the children. You know, this morning the children really came up to her and engaged in ways that only children can engage in. And they were very playful, inquisitive, you know, curious, talkative, and wanting to, to comfort her, wanting to engage her, wanting to feed her grass, you know? And when they realize, through my gestures, because I don't speak, when they realize that she didn't want the grass, a couple of them said, I think she's full, <laughs> you know? And so it's, it's just so wonderful. And then um, a couple of the kids, you know, kept saying to me and mouthing, you're a caterpillar, right? You're a caterpillar, right? And so, um, again, it's these moments of engagement that intrigue me um, because it allows people to think about who she is, what is she, and why is she here, which is, I think, the powerful point of contemporary art is to question the moment. And I absolutely got a sense that it was a completely different atmosphere and experience between yesterday and today. Um, and both aesthetically, you know, very powerful as well.